in the last of this series of sporting conversations, Hugh McIlvenny spars verbally with champion boxer Sugar Ray Leonard. Nerve, a combination of basic courage and productive impertinence, is frequently a factor in boxing, and no fighter ever possessed more of the quality than Sugar Ray Leonard. He has always specialized in breaking the spirits of opponents, even of opponents as previously fearsome as Roberto Duran. In spite of all your extraordinary success in boxing and the simple fact that you're one of the greatest exponents of the game we've ever seen, you do seem to have a, a love affair with it that blows hot and cold. You know, you said when you'd won your Olympic gold medal that that was the end of the journey. Then naturally when you had an operation to correct a detached retina, in 1982, you retired, came back for Kevin Howard in 1984, re-retired immediately, then came back for Hagler, and having won the fight with Hagler, retired again. Is it because, in spite of all the triumphs, you feel that perhaps boxing isn't the right life for you? What, what explains this tendency to, to come and go? I think that... Um in fact, I know that I'm a very sensitive person, very sensitive towards how people perceive me. Uh, when I announced that I would fight, I was, I was scheduled to fight Marvin Hagler. They called me crazy, they called me this and that, and other adjectives. After the fight, I said, that's it, no more fighting, I retired. But I think if I had uh, taken uh, six or seven months to rationalize and put it into perspective, I will still be fighting. When you did take up boxing at the Palmer Park Recreation Center, around what, the age of 13 or 14? 14. 14. I just wonder if you had been imagining yourself in, uh, in heroic predicaments, and if boxing then gave you uh, a natural means of expressing the sort of dreams you had about yourself, about great achievements. I could honestly say that um Watching Bruce Lee and watching Muhammad Ali, I lived vicariously through them. That was me, because they were, they were dominant within their own domain. They believed within them the, the, the power and their style and their knowledge. And that's, that's what makes me Sugar Ray Leonard, because I believe I'm a nonconformist, and what you tell me I can't do, I will do it. They told me I, could, I couldn't beat Marvin Hagler. They said, logic states you can't win. History states you can't beat Marvin Hagler. Biologically speaking, you're not big enough. Physically, and all those other intangibles and, and, and theories. And I brushed them aside and I said, no, because what happened, what would have happened if I had constantly read and, and listened to the television and the, all those uh, editorials and people, the critics, it would have been subliminal. I would start believing it myself but I believe within my own, my own capabilities. Were you very much aware of, of Ali and Sugar Ray Robinson? Did you draw the flourishes of technique that you went in for very early from great men like those two? When Ali was boxing, I would watch him. I, I had to watch tapes of Sugar Ray Robinson because he was in a different era. I studied Bruce Lee, to be honest with you, at martial arts because concentration and what I say is so significant and so essential is tunnel vision, just yeah. to the eye of a tiger. This has, been, uh, this has been very clear in everything you've done in the ring, that when you decide to concentrate, and in the case of the comeback against Hagler, it was, it was particularly blatant that, that you became obsessive about that, didn't you? I mean, you were actually, you say you were having visions, you could see the fight and you could see Marvin. It was so vivid each time, the scenario of the fight. In fact, you, I told the reporters and uh, the sportscasters and everyone what I was going to do to Marvin. I said, well, I'll box him, I would frustrate him, and I would beat him to the punch. 
And they said no way because I was out of the ring for nearly five years with only one fight, which was not that impressive against Kevin Howard, who incidentally knocked me down. Which was terrible, in fact, by your standards. I oh, saw yes. that fight, as I've seen quite a number of your major fights, Ray, and, and you retired immediately after that because you just weren't Ray Leonard at all that night. I just felt that um, it was no sense me humiliating myself any further, but... And alarming your wife, because I remember yes. it was a very moving scene that night, because you told Juanita, you said, don't worry about it, that's it. I told my wife, I told my son in the dress room, I said, this is it, don't worry about me fighting anymore, this is it. And lo and behold, <laughs> here we go again, one yep. more time. Two but I, wait two, I always wait two years later before I make a decision to fight again. But when you did become obsessed with the idea of uh, fighting Marvin, you, you were actually having these, I, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting any kind of mystical experience, but you could visualize Hagler and what was going to happen very, very clearly. It was so intense each time that I would visualize the, the fight, and um, I knew I felt that I could beat Marvin because I was so analytical of him. I watched him because of HBO and I was doing the broadcasting. And each time I would do his fight, I also counted the years that I, would get, I was getting older. Yeah. I said, I'm 30, I'm 31, and we need to do it now or never. But your, your technique and your whole approach to boxing had always made the frustrating of the opponent absolutely key weapon and I think you must have recognized that Marvin Hagler was a man susceptible to frustration and that your ability to cross his wires and and to make him uh, feel impotent in the ring would get to him and I, I think that was a very powerful argument in your own mind about going back to fight. I study Marvin's temperament, his disposition and um, I, I, happened, I did my own research about him as a, as a person, not physically, but mentally, what he, was, what he thought, things that bothered him. So those are the intangibles. Marvin Hagler is a very proud man. Well, he was a very proud man. And I, feel, I felt that if I frustrated him and made people laugh at him, that he would become somewhat uh, inconsistent with his punches. Oh yes, it worked like a charm. In fact, the fight went, I mean, it was like, a, it was as though it was choreographed. And um, it, it was something that, uh, I still watch the fight from time to time because he was like a cup of coffee. You know, it's like, it gets me pumped up when I watch the fight now. Right. It really, it, it motivates me. The other part of you that astonishes people because you're uh, so pleasant when you deal with the public and deal with uh, reporters and broadcasters and so on, and because it's, it's natural for you to get on well with people, it's very easy to miss the fact that there is a real streak of meanness in you when you fight. Angelo Dundee said this to me a long time ago. He said, you know, anybody who's kidded into thinking that uh, the mildness and the sweetness uh, go all the way down when Ray gets in the ring is in for trouble because Ray can be the meanest fighter in there. Have you been aware of that in yourself? Over, you know, for instance, with Hearns, Angela said to me, he said they talk about Tommy coming from Detroit. And so he said, Tommy, for a start, he's a sort of middle-class kid from Detroit. He said, but, he said, when they get in there, he said, never forget all that Motor City Colic stuff. He said, when they get in there, he said, the mean kid in there is going to be Ray Leonard. Did, uh, did you have an awareness of that yourself? I felt that um, there was a transition that I would make from being a very pleasant guy than being a competitive guy, a gladiator, if you will. And we all have a killer instinct. There's no question about that. Some bring it out uh, better than others and more composed or controlled than others. But uh, I, don't, I don't understand it because I... They say, you don't look like a fighter, and you walk into the ring, then you want to get the guy. That's my makeup. Is it, is it partly then the intensity that you have to generate to give you exceptional performances in the ring? You were, you were telling me earlier about how you felt during training for Hagler. That was a very worrying time. 
it, it requires a stimulus for me to get motivated at this stage in my life and career. And trying for Hagler, I was being pounded on by little guys, younger guys, and things were not going my way. And I would go back home with a look of, I don't know, I guess it was obviously that no confidence was in my face, the expression. And, uh, but I, I maintained, I just kept, I kept going straight ahead, I kept saying it's was, gonna, it's gonna happen one day. Was your wife more inclined than ever then to try to uh, persuade you that maybe it wasn't the greatest idea in the world? Well, she said to me, she said, uh, don't you wish that you had not said yes to fight Marvin Hagler? And I said, no, I became very defensive. She said, no, it's okay to feel that way because sometimes we say things we don't uh, really understand or, or, or willing to go through the, the training procedures. It was tough. But did you begin to think, Ray, that maybe you had uh, impaled yourself on, on a vow that you would fight Hagler, that you had made a declaration that had uh, forced you into something that wasn't in your best interests? Yeah, well, it, there was a, a, a sign of, uh, it was something was a deterrent factor, and that was the punches that was being delivered on my head. <laughs> and I felt that if I just maintain and just stay positive, that's my, that's my personality also, I'm very positive. But then by the time you got to Marvin, you had no fear of him. None whatsoever. It was as though I was in control. I walked to the ring. I walked past him. I hit his, I hit the, uh, I guess they call it turnbuckle. They, I punched his corner. You know, if you go back and watch the tape, you'll see little things that I was doing that made him do things that were somewhat uncharacteristic. Hagler was saying, let's go, let's go. He called me names during the fight for the first three or four rounds. He called me, I, could, I wouldn't say it now, but he said things that were not really nice. And- uh, Questioning your manhood then. Yeah, yeah, he used those type of terms. And uh, he was not being himself, and I knew I had him. But you see, you've always, when you talk about battling your way through the doubts you had during the preparation for Hagler, it, it raises a, a thought in my mind that's, that's been there in the past, and it's simply this, that you always seem to be the most controlled of boxers. You seem to be in charge of your own destiny in the fight game. You seem to be the best organized financially and in terms of governing what you'll give to the game and what you'll take out of it. But I just question if Mr. Cool is uh, quite as cool as that. I wonder if you have your own demons. They may be cool hip demons, but yeah. are they driving you on? And, and is it possible that they'll drive you back into the wars at a point when you shouldn't be there? That's one of the major obstacles that we must overcome. Knowing when it's time to quit, retire. We, as athletes, we never want to hear the last bell. We don't hear the last whistle or the last call, last play. All athletes will attest to this because we are athletes and that's what we do best. We were made, certain things are predestined. They meant to be, meant to happen. And we have no control over it once we become older, slower, and we don't think as fast as we used to. But I, I would never get back into the ring when I'm old, 35, 36, because I wouldn't have the same uh, attributes, the speed, and the quick thinking, the footwork. Yeah, and yeah, you've been sitting there, Ray, saying to me that had you thought about it after the verdict against Hagler, had you given yourself a month or two, you, you might still be fighting now, mm -hmm. and you're also saying, yeah, Tommy Hearns is an interesting case. Maybe I should have another little crack at Tommy. And you are coming on like a man who is going to, fight, going to fight again. And, and you know, it, you know better than I do that too many great fighters don't accept the reality of their own decline until the truth is beaten into their heads by another man's fists. And I know you never want that to happen, but are you sure you're clear of the danger? 
I assume the risk factors. That's what makes me also. I also, I'm a realist as far as age is concerned. I'm 31, and I'm pretty much in the still in the prime of my career. 32 very quickly. Let's not even mention that. May, May, May 17th, I'll be 32. 32 big ones, gosh. So I, I feel there's another year left of competitiveness in me, for sure. 33, 34, that's too old. <laughs> that's too old. Of course, what did make it a certainty that your big retirement, if we can call it that, uh, after the operation to cure or to correct mm -hmm. the detached retina, what made it certain that that wouldn't last was the simple fact that you were too young to retire. You were only 26, and, uh, yes. and the juices uh, were bound to get the better of you, weren't they? I was in a state of limbo for two solid years. Here, <clears throat> here I was in the prime, I mean, look, the pinnacle of my career. I was really, I just defeated Tommy Hearns. I unified the title, and things were just getting better for me. And then I was victimized by an injury that doesn't necessarily come from boxing, although boxing doesn't help with the trauma. And um, I just, I was lost. For two years, I was lost. I didn't apply myself to my, my work as far as broadcasting was concerned. I had a, had a TV show called Sugar Ray's All Stars. And I, didn't, I never applied myself because... Because nothing could give you anything like the satisfaction you'd got from fighting. Nothing could compare. It and was eating at you, I, I think you've said, you've used that term, you said it, day after day it ate away at me, the, the realization that I should be in there. It took something away from me because it was very, very important. My sense of pride and my sense of uh, doing what I want to do. And I think you, you, you've also said that you started sort of lying around with the, with the guys and getting bombed and yeah. so on. I mean, obviously, drink and, and worse uh, abuses are well, li liable to threaten a guy who's, who's had such a vivid, dramatic life and is suddenly absolutely idle in his own terms. Well, I wasn't really getting bombed, but I would drink cores. <laughs> yeah, good time to plug it, all right. But I, I wasn't, I wasn't happy at all. I wasn't content. I didn't have a peace of mind. And uh, I'm happy when I'm able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. When you, when you began to see that you were losing your physical definition, I know that troubled you oh, very yeah. deeply. Yeah, and I think. It was an occasion when your wife actually laughed when she saw your concern about the fact that the old ripple had gone from the, the midriff and so on. Yes, the Did love that handles, get to you? It bothered me. I'm a very vain individual because I, I take great pride in my body. That's also because I'm an athlete. And uh, when I didn't have the definition, the ripples in my stomach, it bothered me. And, but then, I, you know, he, I didn't have... I didn't have a drive or motivation to, to, to train to get it back. I mean, there was no reason for me to do those things, those 200 sit-ups, and do three, four, five miles of road work. I didn't have, there was no reason before, other than vanity. Right. But that wasn't enough. I just felt that I wear larger suits and bigger pants, and that's <laughs> what I did. But when you, when you became, I think you also felt that you were losing your your spiritual definition, or your psychological definition, you felt that you really were drifting and that you were no longer the real energy you wanted to be. I think that was when it became certain that you would try again. I cried inside a lot of times. I was, I was always hurting because something was taken away from me. But then again, it was corrected because of the advancement of medical technology. And yet, it goes back to what I stated earlier. I'm, I was so sensitive to the perception of the American public, how they would say, he's like the other guys, that I denied myself an opportunity to continue my career that I love. So that's, that bothered me also. It really, really bothered me for every day. When did you start to realize that you were 
thoroughly out of the ordinary as a fighter. You started boxing around the age of 14. I think you were boxing in internationals having cheated on your age. You were boxing in internationals when you were about 15, weren't you? Yes, I lied about my age because I wanted to, I tried to qualify for the 1972 Olympics. And although the guys that back then were far more experienced than I was, I had the heart determination. And I lost in the quarterfinals. A terrible hometown decision in Cincinnati. Yes, it was, Cincinnati, Greg Ohio. Greg Whaley. Greg Whaley, exactly. <laughs> I went to my dress room, and Hugh, back in the dress room, it dawned on me that what it would mean to be in, on the Olympic team. That was your first defeat as a boxer? Wasn't yes, it? yes, and I cried, and I cried. And there must have been some possibility then that you'd give up on the game, I should think. When you, were you, or were you never quite as disillusioned as that? No, I, I never gave up. I just felt that I lost a decision in the eyes of the judges because of their own criteria as far as how they score a fight. But I was such a confident and very optimistic kid. And uh, I said, maybe next time. I would. But you had four long years before you could get into the Olympics again. That must have looked like a long, long climb to 1976. Not really, Hugh, because I competed in international competition all around the world, Russia um, and Poland and, and Italy. I mean, just everywhere. It was so, it was such an education for me because of different cultures, environments, and there was one there was one incident that took place in Italy, and uh, I was that I was sitting on a on like a little hill, a little mound of some sort. A little girl walked up to me, and she's never seen a black person before. So she looked at me, she stared at me, and she tried to rub the color off my <laughs> hand. And then she ran away, came back with two more girls. They tried to rub, the, they check my hair, ran away. Then four or five. Then eventually, it was about twenty little girls, and they sang for me. It was so. It was so wonderful. I mean, it, here I'm, I'm a kid myself at the time, and I, it was such a joy. Well, and this was one of the sort of bonuses that came from yes. being an amateur boxer. Yes, but that she still she she rubbed so hard, <laughs> and she couldn't understand. She might have done damage because that was at the time when your hands were giving you a lot of serious trouble, weren't they? Oh, my hands, they. Um, they say calcium deposits, because my hands are quite fragile and very yeah. small. For a man who's done a lot of damage, yeah. they, so, they don't look like deadly weapons. Well, they, there's a deception I don't want there. to put it to the test. It's a deception here. <laughs> but I always had problems with my hands, and during the Olympics in 76, my hands would swell. They were always huge, and I would stick them in ice and leave it in for four or five hours. Did you have Novocaine or anything like that, Ray? Did you take injections? No, only time I did that was in my through my professional career was, um, I guess it would, what you call it, Novocaine or whatever. Yeah, but one of those, just, just to, to kind Cortis of deaden, deaden it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, cortisone shots yeah. and those kinds yeah. of things. When was the hand trouble at its worst, Ray? Did it get a little bit easier when you turned professional? Was it at its worst in your, at the peak of your amateur career? There were those that felt that uh, my career would be in jeopardy because of my hands. But honestly, my hands were in better condition because of the we took precautionary measures during training. We used sponges and what have you to alleviate the pressure of the knuckles. And only a few uh, fights that I had problems with my hands. Ayu Kaluli. Yes. I have the metacarpal bone, I guess that's what they call it. Yes. With uh, Hagler, my right hand was grossly. Was it? Yes, it was. And so it's just a couple of fights that I had across my hands. The fact that you have remained with the same bunch of people all through the years, the, mainly the great years, but some of the bad times too, does this indicate that loyalty is a fundamental characteristic of your nature, or does it just suggest that you like familiar things and familiar people around you? Well, we were not always together. Dave Jacobs, uh, when I decided to fight Roberto Duran the second time, he said he wouldn't, tra he wouldn't train me because he felt that the system would beat me again. And uh, he, went his, he went his own way, and I continued my career. It astonishes me, that, because I thought yeah. you were the biggest certainty in boxing against Duran the second time around. You know, I, 
I couldn't believe how anybody could fancy Roberto, great fighter though he was, because I thought you had gone through your ordeal in the first fight and you'd come out the other side oh, because yes. you were winning at the end of the fight. Although I think Roberto won the fight, all right, right. but I think you certainly won the last two and you looked like a man who had survived. And you'd also made a bit of a mistake warring with him anyway, hadn't you? I'm glad you said that you thought Duran won the fight at this point of the interview, because I would not have done it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, what happened, you, I fought Duran in his own style. I tried to beat him at his own game because he he insulted me. He, he, he challenged my manhood. I mean, he made gestures with his hands. And, uh, you know, I felt that certain things I couldn't say or do because of television, because of respect I had for myself and for the fans. But he has a different mentality. But he, so he beat me mentally also. But in the second fight, you had no doubts about it. Oh, no question. I beat you, him. You broke him completely. It's like a bully that's on the street. And all of a sudden, some young kid comes up there and beats him and humiliates him. He, he runs away. He runs away. Is, is Roberto Duran the one guy for whom you find it difficult, the one guy among your opponents for whom you find it difficult to have any affection? Do, how do you regard Roberto? Because you usually feel quite warmly towards you. Once you've got them back in the shower as losers. Oh, yeah. No, Duran, actually Duran and I, we are not really friends. We don't call each other, we don't call each other up on our birthdays. Yeah. But um, I interviewed Duran for HBO and he was very cordial, very professional. And we if I see him, we'll shake hands and talk. Tommy Hearns is a different person. There's a certain resentment there. Haggard. Yes, I didn't really yes. know that. Right. Yes, he would walk he would walk past me without speaking. And really? Hagler, a different type of person. Does that also. make you want to attend to Tommy again? No, because I have probably do the rest of my life because of the way they are. But I think what has happened to Tommy Hearns and Marvin Hagler is the fact that their ego surpasses their personality. It, it takes away yeah. the real person. But in the case of in the case of Duran, you did. I mean, it's clear that Roberto Duran didn't stop fighting in the eighth round in New Orleans because he was physically afraid. It was because he couldn't stand any further humiliation, wasn't it? That I mean, was. He wasn't worried about a beating. He was worried about. Uh, Having, having his macho image very seriously blemished. Here is a man that's demonstrated machoism throughout his career. He's always considered the guy with the killer instinct, the guy that dominates his opponents. And here he fights this little kid with skinny legs and doing a soccer punch, a bolo, and hit him with this punch. I mean, it's, <laughs> it blew his mind. I do this and do that. And it takes away something from them. It's the respect and pride. So it was no mas. Laugh. They laugh, they laugh. And no mas, no more. And no more of that nonsense. Oh, yeah, <laughs> he said, that's. I'm out of here. I'm, <laughs> but you know, I think what happened, Duran just said, the heck with this. I, I can't take this anymore. Without realizing the impact it would have on the world. Of course. That because was, that was clear. It was not a rational Even decision. Even a later, I think he realized. Oh, yeah, he, when, he, when he threw his hands up, it was through frustration and humiliation, yeah. but then... He forgot that the world was out there. He yes. just thought it was the two of you, and he said, you know, and the referees. And so know. now he goes to his his, uh, his physician or his doctor and said, we need a legitimate excuse. What can, what can I say? Oh, cramps. Yeah, cramps. Right, because nobody can disprove it. Cramps. He went, ah, oh, that was baloney. <laughs> Good right sure. hand by Durant. That's now Sugar Ray interrupts. It gets away immediately. And what's happening? Duran says no. I think he's quitting. What is he saying, Larry? He says no. I don't understand. He's saying no, no. He quit. I don't understand it. I think Duran quit. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the solution. Aerial liquid. future master of the welterweight and middleweight divisions was christened Ray Charles Leonard because his mother had hopes that he would be a singer. He was born the fifth of seven children in North Carolina 
but was only four when the family moved north, first to a crowded apartment in inner Washington, and then to the Maryland suburbs of the city, ending up in Palmer Park. Palmer Park is suburban all right, but it can be pretty rough territory, and Leonard was glad of the protective loyalty of his older brother, Roger. Roger boxed successfully, and he did much to convert Ray from a largely pacifist approach to life to an enthusiasm for performing in the gym at the local recreation center. Within the school system, he was, it was quite tough because you had guys that were bullies and guys that would actually take your lunch money from you. I was fortunate to have a brother that um, could fight. Was this Roger? Roger, yes. He's about three years older than Yes, me. and he, he was a part of not a gang, but a group of guys that, um, I don't want to say terrorized, but kind of... Kept things in police, order. Yeah, kind of policed the area. Vigilante. Yeah, vigilante, though. yeah, if you will. And um, I didn't have too many problems with anyone challenging me. It's obvious that Roger, being three years older and being in large measure your protector, was a bit of a hero to you. But I, th I think he found it difficult to share his enthusiasm for boxing. Uh, in fact, read that when you saw him uh, sparring for the first time and saw him getting hit, you were almost physically sick. I, um, when I first uh, witnessed the art of boxing, I didn't want to do that. I just felt that it was not in my best interest. <laughs> no way. And I tried it, you. I tried it, and the gloves were like 16 ounce. And the gloves that size is not difficult to find a target. It's not. And I got a headache, an enormous headache. And I went home and I, and I told my mother, I said, I'm not going to participate in boxing anymore. I quit. Prematurely retired. <laughs> that was your first retirement. My first, and I was, I guess you I was... You got good at that retiring game. Oh, you? I, yeah, I guess it became an art. <laughs> but, um, I was about seven or eight years old at the time. So that was the first one. We should have known oh. then the, the pattern that you were going to go, but you were always going to come back. Well, that's my, I guess that's my nature, to retire and unretire. But when you, were, when you were that age, you were a pretty introspective boy, as you said, and you were inclined to stay at home and read your comic books and, uh, and remain pretty quiet and shy. Yet, when you did take up boxing, you almost instantly became a very extrovert performer in the ring, so it seems. You know, you seem to have found a natural context for some sort of rather extravagant element in your nature. Because I tried to display that boxing is truly an art, the scientific techniques displayed. And um, I felt that by emulating like Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Robinson, guys with finesse and, and guys who were very flamboyant, that boxing would be accepted in a more tasteful-like manner, and it was. The need for money to support the family precipitated your decision to go into professional boxing. It, it had an enormous bearing on my decision-making. My father had spinal meningitis and tuberculosis. He was nearly three days into going to a coma, and he was ill the whole time. He, during the Olympics, he was ill, but he never said, my father's a very proud man, and he, he never complains, but he was always hurting. My mother had suffered, uh, not a heart attack, but I guess it's some... Yeah, a couple of sort of bad turns. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I decided to turn professional because I needed some finances like now, like yesterday. And he was so tough training for my first professional fight because I, would, I was training, but I, I was also crying when I was training because my father was bedridden. I mean, he was so weak. He lost. 60 pounds, and he started losing his memory. He was in such a sad state that I thought I was going to lose him. And God, mm -hmm. I hate thinking about that. Yeah. But uh, he, he convinced the doctors that uh, he wanted to go to see me fight, my first professional fight. And Louis he made it Vega. In. Yeah, Louis de Boer Vega. And he, saw, he was there, and it, boxing is my father's life. He loves it. I mean, he's my cook. He, my father. And when you're in training, he cooks for you. Oh he? yes, uh, my father's 67 years old. He looks like 47, I would yeah. say. 
except a little pop belly, but other than that, he's in great shape. And Louis the Bull Vega, my first opponent, I saw him about five years ago, and it's unbelievable. I mean, he's still fighting undercards. He's still he's an he's an opponent when he fights. Yeah, and he's about that tall. Cannon fodder. Yes. But you you don't have any experience of that world because your first purse or the first uh, pay packet you got amounted to forty thousand dollars for fifty. For, was it 50? 50. Okay, oh. I understand for that kind of correction. Whereas, just to mention one name in your life, uh, Marvin reckons that, that his first uh, fight earned him $50. You may think that's pretty logical. And well, I, I had a vehicle that was the Olympic exposure. Right. And I was more of a commodity, a marketable commodity than Hagler. And he resented that also. And almost anybody, yeah. He did. He said, Ray uh, had it easy. I didn't have it easy. I made it possible for myself to be a little more marketable than he was. I understand Marvin's making a film now. He's in the Philippines. And um, I'm sure it's Rambo-type movie. Uh, I couldn't see Marvin doing love. I love picture. <laughs> love scene, I mean, really, I, mean, I don't mean to sound derogatory, but it's... Are you, I, are you starting to build up the, another fight here? Oh, yes, it works. <laughs> the same way I got him to fight me the last time, the first time, rather, was to say little things, because I never talk bad about anybody or anyone. I, I just say things that kind of get under your skin. There's a bit of, a bit of Muhammad in there, too. Yeah, I think the psychological he, he played warfare that plays a, uh, uh, a great role in any endeavor in life. As you move towards the first uh, acquisition of the welterweight championship, Ray, you were earning a lot of money, as I say, and in the end, you, you were to gross something beyond 60 million. When you started out, had you been determined that there would be a very big fortune at the end of the road? No, I had no idea that um the sport of boss could be as profitable and uh, as, as beneficial as, uh, as it's been in, well, less than five years, actually. You're, you're calculating how long you were active when you yeah. take away the absences from the rings. Oh, it's yes. A, it's it's an amazingly years. short career. It really is. And I, you know, I enjoyed every, every fight and every, um, every session, the training session that I had. What was it that you did enjoy about boxing? Was it the drama? that satisfied you? Was it uh, the color? Was it the sense of being the most special man in the room? What, what was it that, that uh, fed your nature from boxing? That I was separated. I was, I had a certain persona that was different. In other words, people considered me a more of a personality than, than just a boxer. And I value that. And just the, the accolades and the, the praise that people had for me as a person, that was quite stimulating. When you walked into a hotel lobby uh, or just walked along the street, was there a sense of, of people recognizing you as a man apart? And, and is that something that you can ever replace when you leave boxing? The novelty wears off, you know, when it first happens, the fame, the glory, and what have you, it gets to a point where it's, there, it, it's old. You, the, older you, the older you become, the less you want to tolerate. But it's all conducive. I mean, you, can't, you gotta have both. You gotta have one without the other. The only time it bothers me is when I'm with my family, because that's quality time, and that's limited time. And when the when the, the world of your fans intrudes on that, that troubles you then. Yes, but um, again, these are the people that made it possible for me to demand as much as I have, so I rationalize it. But it it often seems that fighters more than other athletes crave not so much the glory as the drama of their lives in the ring, so that when they retire. Almost everything else has an anticlimactic hollowness about it. 
it's, it's hard to imagine that anything will ever take the place in your experience of taking revenge on Roberto Duran, overcoming Thomas Helms, coming out of retirement after five years with only one fairly meaningless fight mm -hmm. within the five years to beat marvelous Marvin Hagler, terrible Marvin Hagler. Now, can anything ever substitute for those experiences? I don't think so, because it's... Will the, will the rest of your life be an anticlimax in, in a sense? I don't think my whole life will be anticlimactic because I, I believe that um, there are other things that I have a knack for. I think I could help people. I have political ambitions also. Do you? What are yes. they in broad terms? Well, just helping people. Well, I won't disclose. Which party? That I won't disclose either. I see. I'm, I'm independent. But you're, but you're quite serious about this. Yes, you, I am. You, well, you'd like to run for office, right? Really. Yes, because I, there's, you know, believe it or not, I have a very low self-esteem because I want to do something with this now, yeah. with my mind. Instead of using the, the, the body, use this. And that's why I stress to my sons. I was gonna ask you that. Would you be happy to let your sons fight? If he want to, for himself and not to compete with his dad, great. But I also stress the fact that you must train, you must train, you must train. And I think it's unfair for a lot of parents that's of statute to convince their kids to be like them. Of course. Because there's enough peer pressure with kids being compared. And then if a, a kid can't compare, my son couldn't compare to me. And that's reality. So let your son right. go to be what they want yeah, to be. I mean, you just recognize yes. that. If he takes up boxing, he's got no chance of being anything like as good as you are. And that's as you say, you just got to recognize that. I didn't get a chance to know my son until, gosh, we did a commercial for uh, some a soft drink. He came, started getting closer. Is that closer. right, Ray? Yeah, and because you and you and Juanita came to the decision when Juanita became pregnant in '73, mm -hmm. and you were looking ahead very seriously to the Olympics, the two of you took the unconventional decision that she would have the child, but you would postpone the wedding until after the 1976 Olympics. It's, it's worked out well for you because ev everything seems to have, uh, to have justified that decision, but it was a pretty bold one at the time and carried a lot of risks, I would have thought. Well, postponement, there was no postponement. In fact, there was no marriage thought about because I was, we just kids then. Right. And that's why we're such believers that uh, teen pregnancy, that's something that is such a dilemma now in today's society. Because single parents, what happens, the kids eventually would go the wrong route, right. go to crime or what have you, yeah. because of the economics. But um, thank God, things just worked out for us. It just right. Things just worked out. If you had to define the biggest assets you've got when you get into the ring, how would you do it? Concentration. That's my biggest asset, major. Because I dissect your vulnerabilities. I look at you and I, and I can find what you are susceptible to. And I keep, I see you. It's like a diagnosis. Oh yeah, diagnosis, yeah, good word. And I diagnose. Is that where it hurts? <laughs> oh, I see, right there or right there. <laughs> But that's my biggest asset. But then, of course, the hand speak, which you were delighted to find when you made your last comeback there, that, or your most recent comeback, that uh, a lot of it, most of it, certainly, was still there. Oh, I, I prepared um, myself um, like a student of the sport of boxing, and um, I did things in stages. I worked on my, my legs first, did a lot of road work, worked on my body, worked on, well, you can't work on your hand speed. Speed is natural, you can't right. teach hand speed. But I worked on certain things and perfected them. When you won the, the title first, the welterweight title, it was by beating Wilfred Benitez. And that was, he was an exceptional fighter. He was an undefeated fighter at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was clearly a special occasion for you. You know, you felt then that it was official. 
that you were one of the head men of world boxing. When I won the title in 1979, um, I didn't have the, the experience to deal with Benitez, but I had the heart and determination. I think I had also natural raw talent that you just can't give someone. But when you were, you were saying that when you beat Benitez, you didn't really have the experience of, of life and of the big time in your sport to, to cope with what was involved afterwards. Well, I was, it was, first of all, it was the fact of fighting for the title in front of so many people, the, the monies that we were making, all those things became a, a, a factor. And um, gosh, and I just knew this was the last opportunity I had for the big fight, the, big, the title. And I went out for it, and I, it was a great feeling. But I was so sore the next day. Was that a tough fight? Really? Extremely tough because he had, he had the same style I had, you know, very very loose slippery. He was. Yes, counter puncher, crafty. He had everything. He could slide around. He had everything, and I think he had a little bit more than I had. But I had more heart, I think. Yeah. 1980 was the year of Roberto Duran. In, the, in, in Sugar Ray Leonard's career, I mean, because you lost to him in Montreal and then you went down to New Orleans and, and beat him very, very convincingly. Uh, 1981 naturally became the year of Thomas Hearns. Mm -hmm. I always felt, Ray, that that was maybe the greatest performance of your career in the sense that you seem to me to be at the top of your game. How, how do you rate that fight? I would agree because uh, at that point, my style, my uh, confidence, my experience were, I mean, on the top of the shelf, I mean, as far as competition. And uh, it was difficult after the Hearns fight to fight anyone that was less significant because I, I wasn't motivated again. And that's what happens. Because you then, I know that you had a very miserable experience with Bruce, Bruce Finch. Finch yes. Miserable in two ways, Ray, because you, you got hit with punches you felt you had no right to be taking, you know, punches that Leonard shouldn't have been taking. Mm -hmm. And also, I think you saw Bruce Finch's wife and kids crying afterwards, and you <laughs> felt sorry for them. And, and you said, God, something strange is happening to me as a fighter if I find that I'm dominated by how sorry I feel for the I family. I felt bad. The his, his wife was crying, his kids were crying. But then I, I said, well, maybe it's better because if I had lost, my wife would be crying, my kids be crying. Yeah. So. Does it make you wonder about boxing though, when it is a game that's gonna make somebody's wife and kids cry? No, no, it's like football, like baseball, I mean. Um, you feel all of life makes people cry. Yes, so. unemployment makes you cry. Unemployment makes everyone cry. But um, I, that was a point where that I understood myself a lot better that I needed a stimulus to be motivated to. I need something that's going to be so significant where the odds are against me because I work hard, I train harder when the odds are stacked against me. Strange that when you were at that fairly low ebb, uh, you then got the eye injury, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, I think you were inclined to distance yourself from boxing to some extent, even before the eye went wrong, weren't you? I was, I was on the verge of retiring anyway because I don't know. I just lost not interest but drive. I didn't have the same discipline, the same self motivation. Things that's so very important and essential in being on top. You certainly had it when you fought Hearns. What do you remember about that fight against Thomas Hearns in Las Vegas? I was extremely tired and... Um, Your wife was in the audience that night, wasn't she? Yes. At the ringside, because I was sitting just behind her, I think, and it was a fight where she had plenty of anxiety, didn't she? Well, because you had a few hard rounds. Yeah, the, well, the fight... fight fluctuated. Yeah, That's what fluctuated. made it... I agree with... AJ Liebling and a few other good judges that it's one of the definitions of a great fight, isn't it? When when one guy's in charge and then the other guy's in charge and then I don't necessarily agree with that. I you like one I side consistency, fights. yes, consistency. <laughs> That's what I like. One way, one way. One way traffic. Yeah. 
Well, that certainly wasn't one way. And I remember you were, you, you showed signs of being in a war that night. You know, he, he, he certainly got to you a bit, the old hitman. But in the end, you, I think, in fact, what I, another thing I remember about it is that you won far more clearly. The, the cards were a disgrace that night, I thought. Uh, because you were getting, you were winning rounds big, and Tommy was was edging rounds, and mm -hmm. they, were, they were going in as one point rounds, you know, which made a bit of a nonsense. But you got to him in the fourteenth in the end. That was a big round, and uh, he was very cooperative, and I love him for it. <laughs> when you then went out of the game, came back, we all we we know what happened with Kevin Howard and Worcester Mass, and then you're you're in idleness again, but. The old uh, bald ogre is waiting there for you. When did you know that you would have to come back and fight Martin Hagler? When he contemplated retirement himself, I could relate to him because I had those same feelings that I didn't want to train anymore, I didn't want to go to the gym, I uh, just didn't want to box anymore. So I kind of felt what he's going through mentally. So I said, it's, it's now or never. And he agreed, and uh, the rest is history. What I, I mean, when you went in there, you've told me that you, you had no fear of that and that everything worked phenomenally well for you. What I felt about this, and this is where the big admission's got to come in, Ray, I thought it was one of the most magnificent performances I've ever seen in boxing, and for you to come back after five years and do that, I thought on points, Hagler won. Thank you, and it's always a pleasure just talking to you. <laughs> 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 great, great, great. Okay. All right. <laughs> you, thanks. It was great. great. All right, everybody. Great. Thank you. And he pinned now Leonard in his own corner. I thought Leonard tried to shake his head as if to say, you haven't hurt me, but I'm sure he has. In the ninth now, midway through, and he's going to fight his way out of it again. Maybe he was shaking his head to really take the confidence away there from Hagler. He'd hit him with his best shots and nothing had happened.